All right, well, we're here with the, one of our favorite presidents, uh, president of Arkimoto, Mark Fraunmeyer. He just had a really exciting presentation the other day on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, and I, the first thing I want to jump in, into, there's a lot of things I want to talk about. But the very first thing I want to jump into is Project Smoke Jumper. Yeah, and so this Smoke Jumper concept kind of came about because we were thinking about I mean, our experiences with the Arkimoto, we were riding around New York City with Mark and it's so nimble. We're able to squeeze in between traffic and kind of got us thinking, what if this could get to something that you need to get to very quickly? Right. I mean, if you can deliver deliveries fast, why not deliver water fast? And obviously, the sooner you get to a fire, the better chance you have of putting it out before it spreads. And, uh, you know, the cavalry is coming. But if you can knock down that fire just a little bit, you could save lives. You could save property. You know, we've got a, a very small footprint vehicle, so uh, we can't carry 300 gallons of water, 2,100 pounds on the Arkimoto. But if we could uh, have that equivalent firefighting capability on something that could get there much faster, make its way through, uh, you know, narrow streets or through uh, densely occluded areas outside, that would be a huge win. What you guys kicked off has evolved into really a multi-company partnership approach to fighting fires. It's super cool. Interesting, because I mean, I grew up in the city and in Boston, and I remember so many times fire trucks could not drive around my neighborhood. They would get stuck making turns and they would spend minutes upon minutes of valuable time towing cars, moving cars just to get to the fire. And I can't imagine how many more buildings and lives would have been saved if our Komodos have been making that turn and just getting right to the fire. Guy jumps out, runs up the stairs with a with a hose and puts out the fire before it even turns into a big deal. And that's that's the whole notion of the, the rapid responder program at, at its root is you get to the problem while it's still a small problem. Right. It's, just, it's the same thing if you're if you're rushing to get somebody first aid or administer CPR or antihistamine shot or whatever it is. Uh, the, the stitch in time saves nine. When you guys first kind of turned us on to this uh, idea, this was like right when, you know, the, the wildfires were were at the gates of our of our city. I mean, we were I, it was it was a hellscape. And we were just thinking, is there anything that we can do? Not just uh, you know to to administer first aid, but is there a way that the vehicles that we're building can be used for actual firefighting? Um, and and I think the the indications that we're now getting is that actually we we might have a real a, a very meaningful role to play uh, in that world, and particularly given what is happening now with the climate, uh, being able to more effectively fight fires is a big deal. Because I know that with wildfires, I mean, there is that like front where the, the fire is kind of progressing through the forest, but then there's also hot embers that are raining down. And so if you have like a nice field, oh, good, we have a field so we can, you know, maybe the forest isn't necessarily going to be burning up to the field. But if there's, you know, stuff that's going to either be falling on somebody's house or something, you could have a, sm a small fire that starts somewhere else. All the rest of the firefighters are busy dealing with that huge fire forest that's on fire, being able to get to that little ember that's caught something ablaze fast and put it out, that is what's going to make a huge difference. Just as an example, one of my mom's neighbor's houses burned down in that fire from, I don't know if it was a pine cone or what, got ejected like 15 miles from the bulk of the fire to uh, the middle of Eugene and, uh, and, and literally burned the house down. And then the house, of course, was just uh, when, when the fire truck showed up, it flooded the place with water. So you have the, the damage from the fire that gets extra time to burn because it's unwieldy to move fire trucks around. And then the conventional firefighting approach just uses a ton of water. So if you can get there faster while the fire is smaller and use a lot less fluid, it has the potential to be a win all the way around. And then another piece to me is cost. I mean, a town buying a fire truck, that's a big deal. That's like whole town has to get together and figure out how to pay for this multi hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment. I imagine that when we get to Smoke Jumper, we're talking a way less expensive piece of equipment that can basically be a force multiplier for that firefighting department. Absolutely. I mean, a fire truck can be upwards of a million bucks, but you could have a whole fleet of small footprint vehicles that are able to respond to, you know, particularly when you think about these embers that are launching 10 miles out. And, and this was one of the things that was super cool about the team that, that we've become a part of. It, you know, one of them is using drones and IR cameras to de detect the fire 
like right when it starts. So you get a drone out there that's patrolling and figuring out, okay, there's a hot spot right there. Then you've got a rapid response vehicle that gets onto the scene as fast as possible um, and neutralizes that fire. It's a much more nimble um, kind of network-based approach to, to solving what is a seriously critical problem. And then even if we're moving away from, you know, wildfires necessarily, and we're just talking about, you know, your average American city or town, um, just being able to either have the Arkhamoto, not even necessarily at a fire station, but, um, you know, because you can only have so many fire stations in town and it's always, you know, oh, you have to They're cross expensive. the, yeah, we have to cross the river and that's always, you know, the rain, you know, the railroad tracks. And sometimes there's a train in the middle of your town if, you know. Bob, one of the volunteer firefighters, has an Arkimoto at his house that he, you know, can go put the fire out, drive it back, plug it in, put the hose in the top and fill it back up and he's ready to go. Um, I mean, that's amazing. And he could get there literally minutes and minutes before the fire truck could arrive. Yeah, if you've got a, if you've got a re replenishable uh, fire suppression source that can come off a hose bib instead of a fire hydrant, that's another big advantage. Yeah, as an investor, I'm just super excited about this because I'm thinking of all the use cases. Like if you're a college campus, for instance, there's dorm fires, right? There's dumpster fires. There's things like that where you could just be taking care of all that if you had an Arkimoto with this system on it. That's our goal. And I mean, I can imagine so many other ways of, you know, uh, hey, let's put a bike path through town. You put two signs on either end and you say uh, emergency vehicles may be coming through. You have the siren, obviously, on your on your first responder uh, smoke jumper. And then it's a cut through town that you couldn't put a road in or anything like that. And it's like, whoa, we just shaved minutes off of getting to the fire while it's still, you know, in your kitchen and it doesn't go to your living room. And, you know, we're not, and again, you're not pumping your house full of hundreds of gallons of water. And that's one of the things that's, that has been, I think, very attractive to the emergency services folks that we've talked to is just the ability to get through densely occluded areas, whether it's public events, like you've got a stadium event or you've got bike paths or you have, uh, like you were saying, Boston. I mean, you, know, you think about the city streets in Boston, uh, they were not designed for the giant fire trucks of today. Ironically, because we didn't have a giant fire which burned down the whole city <laughs> and then we could build a grid. <laughs> How ironic. <laughs> well, hey, it's, it's, it's working so far. Let's, uh, let's keep, keep feeding you guys better tools. And then let's just go to car fires. I mean, in our town, we've got a highway that runs through it, and we're responsible for any car fires in that section of the highway. And so you send off a big truck that gets stuck in traffic on the way to that car fire. I can just imagine an Arkimoto driving down like the breakdown lane or whatever to get to that fire and puts it out minutes before any big truck could get there. Well, And we relocated our fire station to be next to the highway on ramp. Right. Why? Why did we do that? Oh, because we would always cause a traffic jam anytime there was a fire on the highway. Right. And it's just like with an Arkimoto. Yeah, people will get out of the way. But now you don't have to have a whole fire truck right. zooming, uh, you know, downtown and making the tight turns that we have towards, you know, our common or whatever. Yeah. yeah, it's just I can see it already. Well, I, I guess I just want to say thanks, guys, for for really kind of, I think, opening our minds to this possibility. We've talked a lot about the benefit of the Arkhamoto platform for, you know, last mile delivery and getting there faster and hassle of parking and uh, and even the, you know, administering life support to somebody with a rapid responder. But uh, you guys are the ones who first sort of said, hey, could you actually fight fires with this thing? So thank you. This is exciting stuff. All right. I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the number one thing that I think uh, Arkimoto fans write to us about. They, I'm sure they're writing to you about it, too. You brought it up at your presentation. The doors. Uh, yes. Yes. The half doors are now in production. We're, we're, we've got a, a backlog of people we actually owe doors to from our original uh, Evergreen customers. And then now we're able to actually let people configure doors for new vehicles built. And it doesn't have to be a, 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 a backordered thing. So getting to the point where we had doors that really had the fit and finish that we were looking for and the feel was a challenging process. Um, and I'm, I'm glad we're on the other side of it. I can't let you off the hook here. A lot of people have been asking us for full doors, and I assume that's because they come from colder climates. You are in Boston, after all. Exactly. So talk to me about that. Is this more complicated than people think to get the top half right? Like, what's going on with that? So we have, and we had a number of different prototypes of full doors at the show uh, on 222. Uh, last Tuesday. The way that the FUV frame is designed m has made it, you know, 
challenging to land a really nice, fully fitted surface on that frame. And so that's why having some of that, that soft upper enclosure is probably going to be the nearer term option. Just think for a minute uh, how challenging doors and closures can be for any vehicle manufacturer. I mean, Tesla with the Model X, I think that, that their, their Falcon Wing door set them back like, I want to say 18 months to get into production with uh, obviously, you know, massive resources at play. Doors are, are surprisingly challenging. And, and we talked about it just a little tiny bit um, in, the, in the discussion around the, what, what we call the mass market consumer vehicle, the MMC. Um, that's our, our, our sort of phase two of mass production plan with Monroe. To get, the, to get the, the sort of full automotive feel and fit and finish requires a massive amount of development and tooling. Um, and that's a direction that we plan to go, but where it, you know we've we've always aimed to be as capital efficient as we possibly can be in the building of the Arkhamoto venture, and there is you know we believe a giant market in the more more temperate regions that doesn't have that same requirement in order to have a really super kick-ass product. We've been going lowest hanging fruit first. And that doesn't mean that we don't intend to get to the fully embodied uh, automotive fit and finish type of a product. There's a considerable amount of development effort uh, to pull that off. And so we're, we are working on it. It's, uh, it's absolutely a high priority, uh, but it's going to be a little bit of time. So then you showed something at uh, Tuesday's event, which was something that Jesse and I kind of noticed um, when we were driving around the Arkhamoto, when you come to a complete stop, we were noticing that steering was a little tricky because it's you're steering two wheels. But I think you've solved it. It's the new torque vectoring system. Can you tell us a bit about that? Um, is that something that, it, I mean, I hear that it's coming out probably in the fall. Um, but yeah, can you tell me what that solves and how it works? One of the things that kind of differentiates Arkhamoto from a lot of the other vehicles we've seen out there is that there's actually a separate motor for each of the front wheels. It's got dual motor front wheel drive. So what would normally be a differential uh, for splitting torque between the front wheels is actually software. Um, and the, the software that we shipped with is pretty simple, um, sort of like checks your steering angle and a few other parameters in order to determine how much power to give to each of the two front wheels uh, when it's commanding torque. What we've done is, is a much more sophisticated system uh, that uses your, you know, the torque that you're applying to the handlebars, how fast you're going, um, and, and actually uses the front wheels themselves to take a lot of the steering burden uh, to the point where you can actually steer when, when the torque vectoring system is engaged, you can basically use your pinky to steer the handlebars, just, just dry steering. It just makes a huge difference in terms of the low speed feel of the vehicle. I mean, once we once you get an Arkhamoto and you get comfortable with it, you you very quickly learn how to uh, maneuver with it. So it's not a big deal, uh, as, as big a deal for a longtime customer. But for the you know a lot of what I think we're we're really starting to hone is that first time user experience, and we aim to hone that not just in the vehicle itself, but like all of the sort of consumer touch points the uh, all of the communication systems both for new customers and for service and and on down the list ultimately that leads to the app as well but that that initial feel of of just having you know some having to use a lot of arm effort to dry steer it that's one that that we get constantly and that's something that we can fix with software so i'm that's, that's one of the mods i'm i'm very excited about for this year that's pretty exciting, and it sounds like it's not an expensive mod either. We demonstrated it last summer at our showcase. It was uh, it it was a, a heavily hardware modified vehicle, so you know, new wiring harness and new VCU. We've now basically backported all of that effort onto stock Ar Arkhamoto hardware, so it will be literally just a software update. Wow, that's really cool. That's awesome. All right, now I was a bit confused about this uh, platform one dot x. Um, it, you showed this graphic, we're showing it now. And I gotta be honest, I, it, I thought that you were stripping away things to show me something underneath. Right. And then I went back after the presentation and I was looking and I was like, oh my gosh, you made so many major changes. Right. Um, but then it brought up a lot of questions for me. So first of all, uh, this, I'm, we're going to be just kind of flipping back and forth between the two, uh, 
versions of this. So you stripped a lot of stuff off the, the platform. The way that we, and this is, I think, true of a lot of electric vehicles as they sort of first come to market. You look under the hood of a, you know, one of the early gen Nissan Leafs. What's under the hood is packed with boxes that are all connected together using expensive connectors. They've all got, you know, the coolant loops are going through a bunch of different pieces. Um, at the end of the day, that adds up to a lot of cost. I mean, this has been the real distinction between, I think, between Tesla and most of, if not all of the other big car OEMs is the big OEMs have said, okay, we've got, we're going to get this component from these guys and this one from these guys and this one from these guys. We're going to put them all together into a single system. Um, and Tesla said, you know what, we're going to rethink this and we're going to design a single board that does all of these different pieces and drive a ton of cost out of the electronics. When we were getting the FUV to market, um, we didn't have the luxury of going and doing all of that sort of reworking of the, all of those basic components. When we started on 1.x, that was, that was the mission because in order to hit that, our, our cost objectives, our profitability objectives, we needed to combine a lot of that equipment into a single multifunctional components. It makes it easier on service because you, know, you basically say, okay, something went wrong, pull, yard out that box, put in the new one, plug it in, send it back versus having to have a lot of different pieces that you might go in and, and do surgery on. Um, and then for, it makes assembly much simpler and it just, it drives down the cost of components. And you know, our, our fundamental mission uh, in terms of right-sizing the footprint of transportation is heavily linked to making those solutions affordable to everybody. Um, so affordability, mass producibility, those are super key and that's really what the the bulk of the effort behind Platform 1X is all about. And so for people who are like worried because, you know, you, it looks like you've ripped off, you know, the place <laughs> where you put your feet. It, that's not gone. It's just that it, it's no longer part of the platform, right? Yeah, it's no longer part of the platform structure. There are going to be incremental improvements in terms of uh, the, the mechanical experience, a little bit more room in the toe box because of... Um, that that decoupling that we've done on the basic platform architecture. Tell me what it's like when you have Sandy Monroe and Associates uh, and you know other brilliant engineers coming in, taking a look at your platform and kind of you know monkeying around with it and being like, eh, get rid of that, make this simpler. Like you guys, something have... that you probably spent you know hours and hours of time on, and probably you know thousands of dollars of engineering work, and you're and they're just like, yeah, get rid of that. I mean, because if I was an engineer on your team, I, I think I'd get attached to what I designed, right. and it'd be kind of hard to be like, no, we're getting rid of my baby. <laughs> Funny you should bring up that word. One of the things I absolutely love about Sandy and his team is they're like, if you ever get the chance, you know, go go bug them to to teach you Sandy Monroe's hearts and minds. It's like the, a, a, an engineering masterclass. Um, I really think actually Sandy should do one of those, you know, I'm Sandy Monroe and this is my masterclass uh, with that hearts and minds video. But it is, um, they, he's, he's got this thing he calls the ugly baby syndrome where it's it, in whatever company they go into, there's, there's something that the engineers are like super attached to that's been around forever that they just can't see past. One of the things I love about Arkimoto is that we've really bought into the idea, owned the idea that perfection is just a direction. Uh, and that, that the, the more um, brilliant minds that we can get to come in and look at it and say, oh, have you guys thought about doing this? Have you thought about doing that? In a lot of cases, yeah, we have. We've been, you know, we've been working on this thing for 14 years. We've turned over a lot of the stones, but w that, that process never ends. And so to me, it's very important to stay attached to the mission and not attached to something that might not be working as well as it possibly could. So let's talk about API. Uh, it's basically your platform that you're allowing to work with other partners on. And your first big partner, it sounds like, is Faction. They have made an Arkimoto into a driverless platform. This sounds really exciting to me. Can you tell me more about it? I've been talking about this on and off for, for more than 10 years, which is the idea that, you know, I mean, one, we are so far behind the eight ball uh, on climate and emissions, you know, we hit another, there's another big report that came out today that when we think of what, what can we do to accelerate uh, the shift to a sustainable transportation system, part of it is about bringing 
experts in to help us make what we've got better. But then the other piece of that is to say, okay, we've we've built a super kick-ass foundation. Now, actually, we're, we've got a couple of different platform foundations uh, in the works for clean mobility. And there are a whole host of other vehicle makers, autonomous vehicle makers, uh, hobbyist students, researchers out there and, and, and you know, saying, can we provide that foundation to them to help accelerate our common cause? And that's, that's ultimately what the Arkhamoto Platform Initiative is all about. Um, you know, with, with Faction, they were initially thinking they were going to go build their own three-wheeled vehicle platform and get it into production in order to build their autonomous vehicles on top of it. We were able to save them, I mean, I, you know, years of work, accelerate their pace um, so that they could focus on the real value add and the real business model pieces that they want to go after. Now, for us, it's additive to economy of scale, gets yet more brilliant folks working on the same hardware, making it better. Um, and I think, you know, for me, the long-term vision is like every school that's working on electric vehicles should have, uh, you know, should have the Arkhamoto platform as part of their program. Every every nice. high school that's got a, you know, an Electrothon program should consider looking at Arkhamoto Platform 2 components as, uh, you know, as the, as the brains of their vehicles. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I, to me, I see there, there's definitely, there, there's an altruistic component of that, which is um, that we are, are firmly committed to the mission that we're doing. But I think there's uh, also, likewise, a, a real... Um, competitive business reason why we should be doing the very same thing. We want to be a platform company, and we think we've got the right platforms for a huge swath of the mobility landscape, much more than, you know, one company could reasonably do in a very short period of time. Well, speaking of that, I feel kind of dumb because I had an aha moment watching your presentation, which I think you've been telling us all about for a while, but it hadn't gotten through my skull. You said, and I think it's because you put some kind of hard numbers on it. You said in 2025, we plan on having robo valet mass production at ramp two and can you just share your vision because i this is what i think if i came and visited you in eugene oregon i staying at a hotel or airbnb or something i take out my app and this is in 2025 of course and i say um you know i'd like an arkimoto delivered to me a few minutes later it robo valets itself to me jesse and i hop in have a fun day in eugene driving around going to meet you and then when we're done, we just, I assume, kind of get out and it goes and parks itself or goes to the next customer. Is Am I envisioning that right? That's the idea. I mean, it's, it's essentially a, 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 a fleet-wide smart summon. Is it going to be able to drive across? Are you saying it's going to drive across the country to come get me? Or is it is it going to be limited to certain places? Or what, what's what's the limitations on it? The nice thing about Robo Valet is that it is still a phenomenally challenging um, AI hardware software problem to solve. Uh, but it is nowhere near the complexity of the full robo taxi that goes on every road at any speed, carrying humans um, without any failures. So you, you, a few things. One, when it's operating in a driverless mode, and that could either be remote controlled, remotely assisted, or autonomous, it doesn't have humans inside of it. There's this kind of uncanny valley with autonomous vehicles when you're inside one. Like, is this, you know this feel of being driven autonomously um, that you don't have to worry about. There's also, uh, you know, so, so when you know that you've got a human in, contr in, in the driver's seat, that human's actually piloting the vehicle. And that plays to, I think, the benefit of the Arkhamoto platform, which is when you're in one, you don't want it to drive you where you're going. It's, it's actually just super fun to drive it yourself. But we can also do things like, it, to, to your point, uh, you're at a hotel. Um, we can plan fixed routes from our depot to that hotel or have it only run on, you know, certain constrained loops and, and roads within the town that are precisely mapped out within a one block walk from a, a huge chunk of the population who might be using it. It is basically, it's these steps towards the full robo taxi but done with technology that's essentially readily available today. 
So you're putting safety constraints on full, a full self-driving idea where you're saying, OK, look, it's not just going to be driving any old where we're going to pick where it's going to go. We're going to pick what speed it's going to be going at and where within you know the realm of uh, a city, the city is going to kind of have an understanding of, of where these robo uh, valets are going to be driving. Um, and so they can either design that in or we'll figure that all out. Instead of it just being like, they could be anywhere. Whoa, it's a robo something. The way the way I think about it is if if it, it has the same business model financial impact as RoboTax, you're very close, but does so with technology that doesn't have to be the perfect, perfect RoboTaxi in order to deliver the system, right? RoboTaxi has got to get all the way to the finish line in order for that model to work. For RoboValet, um, it, it can work with technology that we've got available now. It's, you know, it's, it's a combination of teleoperation and autonomous driving uh, on fixed routes. That's, that can work today. Uh, all that being said, our goal is to provide the right platforms for autonomy and driverless. We are not presently developing RoboValet, although if you look at what like Faction is doing, their, their autonomous delivery system could easily be purposed to be a robo valet system as well. Because, I mean, worst case, even if we were to say today we need to turn it on, um, not necessarily you, Mark, but Mark and a partner, how are we going to get a robo valet? We need it today because uh, someone important is coming. And we would we could go, OK, uh, Jesse, you're going to be in your room with your with your steering wheel and uh, that is going to be connected up to the car. And that's something that we could probably bang out in a week and a half for like a hackathon or something like that. And um, obviously we can make it much more safer. Are you volunteering for that? Is that what you're doing here? That's, <laughs> but, it sounds like that's what you're doing. But basically it would say, <laughs> uh, Jesse, you have three cars in your queue. Uh, please move this Arkimoto to the front of the hotel to pick up Zach. Um, and then uh, the next car I could be driving, but you can also automate it. And then when it goes, uh, I don't know what's going on. It could, it could then say, Jesse, help this thing and it's like oh okay i'll go around the the surrealist art that someone left out in front of it and it doesn't know what to do with it yeah and, and i i've talked to some folks in that world and they say you know it, initially they think it would be like a, a that one operator could run four vehicles simultaneously uh long-term goal would be like 10 um but think about think about an uber right like what's the cost of an uber right it's the cost of the vehicle plus the cost of getting the vehicle to you, plus the cost of taking you where you want to go, right? The big chunk of that is, is like the cost of taking you where you want to go, right? The vehicle might be a couple of blocks away. The driver, the, the first minute is the driver bringing it to you. And then the next 25 minutes is, is the driver driving you, uh, who is a, already a very capable driver, uh, across town, right? So... In terms of taking cost out of that rideshare model, and if you take cost out of the rideshare model, you open it up to wider and wider and wider audiences of people who can take advantage of it. But if you take look at the vehicle piece of it and you say, okay, the vehicle side, it's going to be an electric platform that's lightweight, low cost. Uh, ultimately, long term, we believe it's going to be very low maintenance. You look at the, the bringing the vehicle to you side of it and you say, okay, we can, we can either you know four to one or 10 to one. Uh, cost reduce that, and then we'll entirely take away the cost of driving the vehicle while you're inside of it. Um, you get, it, it, you know, you're sort of asymptotically approaching uh, the robo taxi using tech that's that's uh, that's ready almost now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so exciting because I think it's safe to say this sounds like it'll be one of the first autonomous vehicle situations, commercial situations, because like you said, this is going to almost by nature have to beat Tesla, no matter how good Tesla is, because they just have so many more hurdles to jump through. Um, a vehicle that has a person in it is a different situation than an Arkimoto without a person in it. I think Tesla's, you know, Tesla has, is, has got phenomenal research going on in terms of, of driverless technology. I think they're arguably leading the world. And again, there's, from our perspective, there is, you know, we're not in competition with that. We're building an, a new platform um, that, whether it's Tesla's stack or anybody else's, could ultimately sit on that same platform. 
Um, in, and, and where we see the differentiation is just we're designing it around the everyday vehicle usage pattern. One or two people with a small amount of stuff uh, traveling a relatively short distance. So we see a big place for that pattern in the future transport world. We also see a place for full-size automotive class vehicles, albeit uh, I think it would it would be better if they were a much smaller fraction of the number of vehicles on the road. I just think regulators are going to have a far easier time with this concept first, and then it's going to make everyone feel comfortable to go to the next steps after it. So, I mean, to me, it just seems like it's a no-brainer that this would be by nature the first step that was right, that was allowed. Well, and I think we were, we're already seeing that with companies like Neuro that are doing uh, autonomous delivery. They don't have a safety driver. They've got, a, it's a vehicle that is purpose designed for delivery. It goes low speed. It's designed around that idea that there is a, a remote teleoperator that can, you know, phone in if there's a problem. Uh, and I, my understanding is they're they're really rolling that out in larger and larger numbers and with with the blessing of regulators. I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the fact that you talked about some production numbers. It's really getting exciting now. You were reporting from Ramp, which was awesome to see. Um, and you talked about that you had about 500 Arkimoto's uh, made last year, if I read the graph right. So it was cumulative. We've, we've cumulatively built now more than 500 Arkimoto since we started production. We built uh, over 300 last year. And so you're looking to triple that this year. So that'd be around 900. We want to break into four digits. Oh, that'd be nice. That would be nice. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you're talking a 7X I heard in 2023. Back to that platform 1X, that's the unlocker of the big jumps in scale. Now, I think uh, you're super excited to talk about this. So are we, uh, the MLM, the Mean Lean Machine. The mean Lean Machine, the ultimate multi-level marketing program. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, don't you know that MLM's a multi-level market? I'm like, yeah, all of our customers are gonna be selling the heck out of these things. So I have some questions about this. Um, we love e-bikes. We have a whole channel where we review them. We love them to death. What is the advantage of the third wheel on an e-bike? Like what, what are we not, what am I not getting here? The real genius of what Bob Mile came up with at Tilting Motorworks is a three-wheeler that feels like a two-wheeler. So it's got that same you know, nimble ride, the ability to lean, that just it, that really the kind of fly the road of, of the two-wheeler that motorcyclists absolutely love, um, but with much more stability, much better traction, you know, the, the challenge with a, with a motorcycle, motorbike, e-bike is, you know, you hit a patch of gravel, you hit some, some grease on the road, you hit a railroad rail, and you can crash the bike and have debilitating or, or worse injuries in, in pretty simple uh, circumstances. Having a third wheel makes a huge difference in terms of basic stability uh, of, of the vehicle platform. I mean, it's the difference between an Arkimoto FUV and a typical bike. You can carry more stuff. And what we've done is not just, we didn't just stop at the, at the sort of three wheel tilting e-bike, um, but we put a motor on each wheel and you pedal a generator. So that generator gives you, you know, very precise control of throttle and feedback um, from the machine to deliver. Uh, I mean, it's, I, I would just say, I encourage you to take it for a ride. Um, I, when I took the, the very first ride of our first prototype, I leaned it further than I'd ever leaned a two-wheeled bicycle. Because I you know, even, I've, I've ridden a bicycle my whole life, but I've never, I've never been crazy carving into the turns because it just, it never felt really secure doing so. With this thing, you just, it's just very natural. It's a next level feel. You've got two front wheels, for better traction, better braking. Um, ultimately, that we think is going to yield a safer experience. Um, and then uh, we've, we've got a whole lot more in store that we haven't talked about yet that we're excited about that are really kind of next level EV features that we haven't ever seen done on an e-bike class vehicle. So I don't, I mean, I think that MLM will compete at in that kind of premium e-bike category. Um, but I, mostly what I see it as is it's offering a lot of a lot of feature, a lot more features to get people out of larger vehicles. Right. People who would say, well, 
I would ride a bike, but I won't because X. I get grease on my leg, and I like to wear nice clothes. You know, we're already seeing that e-bikes, the e-bike adoption has just gone up like a hockey stick, and people who have e-bikes ride them way more than people who have conventional bikes. But we think there's a lot more room on the sort of the top end of that experience that ultimately acts as a disruptor for much larger vehicles, which is just core to our mission. Is it safe to say that riding a three, you know, your MLM is like going from a traditional bike to an e-bike? Because when we try and explain e-bikes to people, it's it's almost impossible to do. You have to get them on the bike. And then when they get on the e-bike, they go, oh, this is what you're talking about. Right. I would say it's it's that that order of magnitude of awesomer. Um, and, and this is, you know, even even within the company, look, I, as with any new Skunk Worksy project, there's always skepticism. Once people actually try it, they're like, oh, now I get it, right? And it, I, I think that's going to be uh, I, that's the case with the with the FUV in the first place, right? Is people look at it, they're like, oh, what is, what is this? You know, this is some kind of golf cart or something like that. They get in it and they're like, this <laughs> this ain't a golf cart. This is this is a whole new thing. I think that's going to be the same experience with the Mean Lean Machine. So let me just just to help me conceptualize it. I get that it tilts. How does it? How much does it weeble and wobble, but it doesn't fall down? Like, can I can I fall off of it? If I'm riding, because that's, I'm just thinking of, uh, you know, my grandmother, for instance, like I want to get her an e-trike so that way she can ride it without the fear of falling over and, and breaking something. I mean, you, you can certainly still fall off of it, right? Uh, it, I mean, it can, it, if you lean it all the way to its maximum lean angle and then you keep going, it will tilt over. Um, we think it will be, you know, have, uh, have one of, if not the best you know, lean angle and steering angles of any tilting vehicle we've seen in the world. It's going to be, I think, greater than 45 degrees of lean, greater than 45 degrees of steer. Um, and that all comes back to some of this really awesome work that Bob Mile did and, and why we acquired Tilting Motorworks in the first place. Um, but e even when you're, when you're riding it, it's just it, it, because you've got that wider stance platform on the road and that rotational inertia on each of the three wheels, it just you can, you know, you can ride it without hands, much more easily than a typical bike. It just it just stays up, um, but it's also super nimble and you can fly the corners. But there's this juxtaposition I saw that I couldn't. On paper, you said that it took care of these three things, but the bike didn't seem to. So I need your help here. So first is the seat. I love the Arkimoto because it looks like a nice comfy seat. It is a comfy seat, whereas I hate bike seats. That's just me. Uh, second one is protection from the elements. Arkimoto protects me from the elements, um, which is great, but this one doesn't. And the third is that in an Arkimoto, I can have my buddy sit behind me if I want to. But on this one, it didn't appear you could. But yet, I did see that you you said that all those three things are taken care of. So can you explain why I didn't see it in the bike itself? We actually showed two different prototypes. Uh, one was our the, the one that's in the video that's on arkhamoto.com slash MLM presently uh, is our is our generation two version of that machine. And it has a, a, a long seat with a pillion. So you can actually seat two people on the seat. It's going to have foot pegs for your backseat passenger. Um, it, you'll be up close and personal like you would be on a motorcycle, but it can carry two. Um, we have not shown yet the, uh, the, the ways that we intend to improve your protection from the elements. Um, it won't initially be you know, some kind of a fully embodied vehicle, but the, the goal is to keep a lot, of the, a lot of the elements off of you in a way that a typical bike doesn't. So think uh, good fairing, good protection for hands, legs, lower torso, um, and then, you know, wear a jacket and a helmet with a visor and you're good to go. That sounds exciting. I mean, it it does, when I was watching this, it did look like the kind of thing you have to experience to really fully get. And I think that'll be one of those things where having our, our, our first time user experience model be focused around rentals and destinations. That's where I see that pairing, you know, really well, where you've got, uh, where wherever we're renting FUVs, in a lot of cases, the, they rent electric bicycles uh, as well. So having the Mean Lean machine as an option in those channels will help drive interest. Uh, but I have been I've been very pleased at the amount of interest that we've seen in this vehicle so far. Now I'm used to e-bikes, so I'm used to kind of you know, oh, is this a 250 watt motor? Is this a 1,000 watt motor? Roughly, what's the power? 
uh, capability of the MLM. Uh, so you've got you've got three motors that are that are all equivalent to a typical e-bike motor. The throttling of that is is going to be controlled by the regulations of whatever jurisdiction that we're going into. So it it will it will have a lot more power than a typical e-bike. I should I should say. And then you said that it has a huge range. You were potentially up to two and two hundred plus miles. Yeah, and this is one of the things we're doing that's I think also a little bit different. We the the vehicle will have one built-in battery, and then the ability to have multiple auxiliary battery modules. So if you've got uh, if you're fully loaded, you've got the the built-in battery and two uh, aux modules then we're shooting for 200 miles of range. I want to ride this thing. I want to ride it around the planet, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so then my, my other question is, uh, I've ridden a bunch of different e-bikes, um, some of them nicer than others, uh, and sometimes you run out of battery. Um, sounds like it's not going to happen on this one. Is there any way to run it? Because uh, I know you can charge it while you're sitting there. Can I be riding it on like no charge and it still will be putting my energy from the generator into the motors yeah 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 i mean it's it, to the extent that you, you're able to at least give it enough wattage to run the basic electronics um you'll be able to move with whatever you're generating from the pedals but i think that, that's one of the other cool things to me is just that you can have it stationary and charge it up so if you think about going on a long tour and you're out in the sticks camping you know you get off the bike get back on it a couple hours later and give yourself a you know an hour or so of of regen to get to the next town um it's one of the one of the absurdities of the modern stationary exercise bike is that you you plug it into the wall so right. like you're, you're 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 just burning off all this power and yet that device is powered by the grid so then if I have it in a stationary mode, it must you must be able to lock it from leaning. Um, can I drive it like that? Like if I if I want my grandmother to go on it, which I do, <laughs> and I, and I want to put her on and I don't want Granny to fall over, can you lock it so that way it is more of a trike, more of a traditional? Oh, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take that back to the team. Um, the you know the way that you the way that you stop it right now is you just kind of put the kickstand down, right, and you and you and you're in stationary mode. Um, but we have looked at different ways of locking the pivoting mechanism in order to, uh, you know, keep it just sort of fixed up right. Uh, but I, I would also say you, you, might, you might see how Granny does on the stock bike. I think it's going to be one of our, you know, the key older markets or markets for this is people who just don't want to fall off a bike. Um, and this, is a, this offers a big step for those folks. No, I, I really agree. I think the safety aspect here is something that can't be overstated. Um, you know, especially when you get to a certain age and you value your life, you just hear so many, so many people who ride a bike, it's almost like a hundred percent are going to get into some kind of accident at some point, just because of slippery roads usually. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, if, if that can be avoided primarily through this, like that's a huge, uh, I would be attracted to that hugely, especially as I age. Having one wheel in front is, is, is not best. Um, and when you've got two wheels for braking, two wheels for steering, two wheels for stability in the front, makes makes a big difference from a safety lens. Now, this uh, platform is also going to be applied to some other different looking vehicles. You had mentioned tuk tuk scooters, delivery vehicles. Can you talk more about that? I could, but it's all that's all like very very drawing board. When we think of this, we really think of this as our second platform, our first new fundamentally new platform since starting the company 14 years ago and that that the platform is really it's this it's the the drive system battery combo and a new wheel um, and that those can be applied to a whole range of different mobility devices um, we think we've got some new takes on some old patterns um, but you know we're we, we want to keep the focus so I, I wouldn't expect anything um, new on those fronts for for uh, a year at least. Now, last question here, Mark. You've gone through so many uh, challenging times. I mean, the pandemic is challenging. The fact that you are expanding into new buildings and so forth. How do you feel about 
Arkimoto going forward? I mean, you've been doing this for years and years and years. Are you getting tired of it? You're ready for a break or are you just like pumped? Tell me what's going on in your mind. I think we're getting to the fun part. I mean, the scaling production is, is a real challenge. Uh, scaling production in the middle of a pandemic when supply chains are absolutely insane has been very hard. But the, the pace that the team is moving at right now is so much faster than it's ever been. And we're working on the coolest stuff that I see out there in this, you know, uh, micromobility right size footprint space. Yeah, I'm, I'm having fun uh, and, and ready for what's next. So um, it's, it's an exciting time. And I think one of my big hopes was that when, when the world really started to take clean transportation seriously, that we would have real solutions to offer. And I think we're at that point. Mark, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. It's been really great talking to you. My, my pleasure. My pleasure. Anytime, guys.